Hello, and welcome back to that podcast at the intersection of faith and fear, where every week, and especially this year, and especially this episode, we discuss what scares us in order to find what saves us. This is the fear of God. Speaking to you right now is one of your hosts, Nathan Rouse, and typically with me is fellow co-host Reed Lackey. And you guys, he was here a minute ago, but he said he had to go get a second winch. And I didn't even know Reed knew what a winch was, much less already owned one of them. But in the meantime, allow me to welcome you back into our big series for the year, What Scares Us slash What Saves Us, a series defined by you. You've been submitting your stories of films and media that instilled or stoked a certain fearful imagining in you, and we are going to be sharing your stories and covering your submissions as part of this series. Last week, we visited that magnificent creature of the night, Pumpkinhead, and this week, we're venturing deep, 47 meters down into the deep, and not only are we stirring some of my own existential dread with this film, but it was submitted by foreign correspondent and favorite Canadian Vera Gowdy, and who is also a guest on this very episode. Vera, welcome. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> they have those there, right? I know you're like, your holiday seasons are a little out of sync with Murica's. Yeah, our new year is the same. <laughs> Happy um, almost one year anniversary of pandemic too. <laughs> oh, whoa. Speaking of what scares us. I uh, welcome Vera. Thank you for being here, for sharing your time and your thoughts um, and your fears, frankly. Uh, I do want to remind listeners, as I am getting a bit ahead of myself, as I'm prone to do, that here at The Fear of God, we explore. We don't explain, except for right now. When I explain that you can listen to The Fear of God at your nearest podcast platform, you can watch The Fear of God on YouTube, and you can browse The Fear of God on the web at thefearofgodpodcast.com, where you'll find Reed! Hey, buddy! Welcome <laughs> to the show! I, you know, I had grand plans of coming back in of all like... Yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Read. <laughs> you've been like you've been bringing me on like very you know like quickly in your you know like i'm found right up front on the yeah. website so i'm just know. trying to uh, it's brevity read it's we brevity. need to talk it's, it's right? really important yeah it's really part important. of our i do want to specify that uh the winch i had to get was the lever pulley device not the viking barkeep so you know like i just well they're spelled differently that. too so <laughs> that know, is true that but would... you did not spell it out for well, the it's true it's true but what's no, funny about good. this bit what's funny <laughs> about this inadvertent bit that just developed right before our eyes is that when i went to ensure what i knew what i was talking about i looked it up and i was like nope not the barkeep spelled that one wrong <laughs> <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> so yes that's how i know for certain oh. that it is not spelled the same way read all right vera's here Hi, Vera. It's good to see She's you. Sporting hey, her, you? her her Grogu hoodie. Oh man, I love. We love. He protect. He protect. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, we're big fans of Grogu. We still call him Baby Yoda. Always Baby Yoda. It's kind of hard not to. It is. It is. In fact, it almost makes you wonder, like how how much did you guys test that name? <laughs> I mean, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, it doesn't matter. Just yeah. somebody bang a keyboard. Hey, oh, guys, we made Rise of Skywalker. We're okay with Grogu. <laughs> 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 Wow. All right. We got a little business time. Uh, Reed, you didn't know I was going to throw this out there, but because it is up there now, uh, we have a trailer of a bona fide commercial. We are legit now for We're moving on up. Moving on up. <laughs> Go, Vera. Do you know that one? Sorry. <laughs> to the east side. <laughs> nope. Nope. Okay. All right. Next time. For a minute, because I was like, I clapped sign back. language. That's not good for a podcast. They nope. can't hear nope. that. Nope. No sign on the pod. Uh, <laughs> just when we ask you a question and people are like, oh, I guess she just signed her answer. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. So, yes, we have a commercial now. You can, uh, and, and not just that we have it, but I want to encourage listeners, especially if you've been with us for a while and you're like, 
I know a person who might like this show, but I don't know how to send them. A, I don't want them to listen to a two hour episode because good night. These guys talk forever. <laughs> this is an easy way to get uh, to whet their appetite. Whet. Their whet. Appetite. Yep. Um, W-H-E-T um, for the show and get them introduced to us. So, yes. And Reid, do you have any business times you want to discuss? Like they need to submit. Do you want to talk about that? What we're doing? Yeah, to, uh, yeah. I would just, I would just strongly recommend. Obviously, we're in the thick of the series, so we have a good chunk of the series programmed already. But it is never too <clears> late <throat> to share what scares you. So go to the fearofgodpodcast.com, click the banner on the top, go to the submission form. There is still plenty of time to share your stories of what, you know, media, whether it be books, TV, uh, music, anything that scares you and uh, a brief a few words about why um and who knows even though uh we're into the series right now if you submit something we haven't covered yet it is possible we'll cover it so um and you know and i should also say that even after this series is over that opportunity will remain that is the platform through which listeners can submit and say hey y'all need to really you know get to it and cover this and we'll hear that submission and you know, promptly discard it. I'm just kidding. We'll, well, we'll take it into wow. <laughs> we'll take it into serious consideration. Who knows? Uh, maybe we'll maybe. Uh, we'll program For it in the upcoming week. WSU Part Two. Yeah. Uh, Vera, do you have any business you'd like to go over? No, I'm good. Well, Thank you. Guys. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> well, let's if we can read. We're gonna get to um, uh, Vera. hadn't said a whole lot now, but she yet, but she's about to contribute more than she may have known, and we're gonna do a little segment. Hello. Okay. Isn't that lovely? That's that's that twelve kinds of adorable. One this of Vera's great. children. Uh, my four-year-old. Funny story. This is not my what you're watching, read and listen to. Um, just the other day, she out of nowhere started saying what you're watching, reading. <laughs> her version of the jingle and i was like what because i'll listen to our show on tuesday mornings when i'm taking her to mm. preschool mm. and clearly she has picked that up wow concerns me a little bit i, I dropped I dropped the b word a lot a couple weeks ago so we may have to <laughs> I clean up you some out, language though. you're fine you did you did know. yeah 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 <laughs> she'll, she'll just go son of a and i'm like whoa <laughs> no, <laughs> no kid. She'll, she'll actually make the tone she'll be like son yeah, of a yeah 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 <clears throat> anyway i tried to get her to actually say the song and i couldn't you know you can't make these kids do things it's mind of their own it's one of the hard things about parenting um so Vera, you're our guest. What what would you like to share? What are you watching? What are you reading? What, pray tell, might you be listening to? Um, so on the subject of kids, I picked a kids show to talk okay. about today. Um, because it's a show that I enjoy watching with my kids and it was made intentionally for families to watch together. Um, and it's just so well done. It's called Bluey. It's on Disney+. Plus. Um, it's about a family of dogs. They're um, Australian healers. And it's just, it's a beautiful show. The episodes are touching and funny and cute. And my kids love it. And they play all the games that the kids play. And there's so many things that our family has adapted from the show, like um, tactical leap, going to the bathroom before you go to bed or leaving the house. Like, <laughs> just like things nice. like that. I sometimes That's forget so that. so much yeah. fun that like we've adopted as a family. And uh, yeah, so if you have- So is it a cartoon or is it like a live- It's a huh? cartoon. It's about okay. a, like a, a family of dogs. Bluey is the oldest girl dog and she has a little sister, Bingo. And um, it's just, yeah, I love it so much. And I love that they made it. So the, the people who created the show um, found, they did market research and found out that only 11% of kids shows are watched alone like the kids watch alone, the rest of the time family is around. So they made something intentionally for families to watch and enjoy together. So there's a lot of um, humor in it for adults, not adult humor, like not like Shrek, but humor sure. in it for adults. Right. The parents are actual real characters who do like good parenting and they get annoyed at their kids and all this kind of stuff. So if you have young kids and even older kids, I think the whole family can enjoy it. And I just love it so much. And I want everybody to love it. I and love it. I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> what? Read. Uh, listen, Nathan, what? I have, as she was talking, because I trust Vera this much in her recommendation, I pulled up Disney Plus on my phone 
and went ahead and so added the series. No, I was okay. hearing and responding. Yeah. Um, and I added it to my watch list. And you yeah, will be delighted to know that it's only eight minute episodes. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Done. Sold. Favorite. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Disney Plus only has season one. Um, and then in North America right now, they're airing season two on Disney Junior. Um, so they're like, I don't know, a third of the way through right now. And then once that's all out on Disney Junior, they'll put it on um, Disney Plus. But like season two has a beautiful episode called Sleepy Time that my kids watch every night now before they go to bed. There's Aww. an episode called Granddad um, about the mom dog's father who just had like heart surgery, heartworms. And about how he wants to play with his grandkids, but he needs to learn to take it easy and like how much, uh, how fast time goes, but wow. it goes slow at the same time. Like, it's just so beautiful and well done. That's cool. Definitely check it Very out. exciting. I love, I love like about our show that like, it's this, you know, backdoor family show, this podcast, like, <laughs> you know, because I guess in my mind, flashback five years is like do i want to watch listen to a horror movie podcast i don't know i'm really into horror movies and horror you know it's like it's so scary and <laughs> to the person to the uninitiated you know of the fear of god they're like oh man this is some dudes just talking about horror movies but no no this is the family show <laughs> where <laughs> i drop bad words that read bleeps and vera offers you know uh, uh wholesome entertainment we're going to talk about what scares me specifically soon. So that's I'm true. Gonna... That's true. Yes. You're our, yes. You're balancing it out. I get yeah. it. Totally. Reed, what about you? So um, <clears throat> I, I just finished a book um, and I believe I was trying to go through in my mind to remember if I had referenced this book before, because it's a book that I started before found too daunting and left on the shelf. And now I have made it through rolled up my sleeves and finished it. So I can't remember if I've ever referenced this on pod before, or if I've ever referenced it to you before, but uh, the name of the book uh, by Dolly Chug um, and uh, that's spelled C H U G H um, is called the person you mean to be. And hmm. the subtitle is How Good People Fight Bias. And I had the reason that I had put it down before is because it is very daunting. And I still found it incredibly daunting. I finished it this time, but it is the kind of book that I feel like in the way that you know you need to stay healthy by keeping an exercise routine, not just exercise for two weeks and then give up on it. It's the kind of book that I feel like I probably need to, now that I've completed it, maybe go back and read a chapter a month and just let that chapter sort of sit in my psyche. Because the, the premise behind the book is that there's a lot of people who would categorize themselves as good people. So they find it very difficult to process and digest when they're confronted by situations where they uh, are called out for sexism or racism or any form of prejudicial bias, not just in those sorts of, um, you know, reductive sort of identity politics kinds of things, but any form of like confirmation bias or anything. They find it very, very difficult to um, accept that and to embrace that. And so what I love about the approach is the author, again, Dolly Chug, she presumes that you intend to do good and to be good. And the premise of the book is, here's what's holding you back. So that's why it's so challenging is because you'll read a chapter and you're like, God, that's not me. That's not me. Halfway through the chapter, you're like, holy crap, that is so me. Like, I do that all the time. Um, wait, just a couple of ex uh, examples. Like, she talks about how she's like, we all assign ourselves an identity. And then we look in the world around us to be affirmed in our identity. We want that identity granted to us. So if I assign an identity as I'm a, uh, I'll use the word feminist, like I'm, I'm, I'm a feminist, I'm a forward thinking feminist, that's fine. So then if I have assigned myself that identity and then I make a remark that someone else says, well, that's, that's a very sort of gender biased kind of sexist remark, immediately I'm going to feel what the book calls self threat and be like, I'm that's not me. I'm not, I don't know what you're talking about. You clearly you're the problem because you are too judgmental or too sensitive or whatever. And the book does an exceptional job in the way that like a good doctor will cut you open to help you, you know? And so he'll like, it'll hurt to help. Um, the book is very uh, precise about saying like, here are the things that 
you're not taking into consideration. And here are the things you need to take into consideration. Like the, it makes a distinction between where a lot of people sit when they're trying to confront bias, whether that be systemic bias on like national, social, global levels or individual biases in their home or their, or their personal relationships or at their workplace. And it'll say there are believers, people who believe these things are real and believe they play a factor in day-to-day -day reality. And then there are builders. Builders are the people that I think most people want to be, or as the book calls, the person you mean to be. You mean to be a builder. What you may be is merely a believer. And you might not know how to build because you might not know how to confront your own biases, like um, I'll say this, and then hopefully my pitch will be sold on the book because I think it's really valuable for, a, for everybody really to read it. Um, like she talks about how, you know, if there is like a hate crime against a group of people, it can be really easy for a bunch of people to immediately find the gay person that they're friends with or the person of color that they're friends with and immediately be like, oh my God, this is so devastating, you know, and, and they start talking about all the ways that it affects them and all the ways that it's like me, me Reed Lackey as a, you know, white straight male going to, to a person that I know who is LGBT and being like, oh my God, it's just so devastating, you know, this, this thing that has happened and this hate crime that's taken place and then just sort of pouring out all of how this has affected me, then unknowingly I'm positioning them to support and affirm me Yeah. <laughs> when, yeah. when in fact I'm, my intention may be in trying to show support to them, but I've made it all about me. And uh, the book has a lot more very specific examples of things like that. For instance, we do this on the show way more times than I'm comfortable admitting, uh Oh. but it talks about how <laughs> the, the act of, abstaining from trying to pronounce a name that you find intimidating hmm. you're you're trying most likely to not be offensive by mispronunciation what you are most likely communicating is i don't care to put in the work to learn your name and they and 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 that hit me because i do that so much i've done it on this show before i've done it in my personal relationships um, and, and that, that really hit, I am so guilty of that. It's like, I don't want to be offensive by saying it wrong. The appropriate thing to do is to engage to some degree. And obviously when we cite celebrities, we don't have the, the, the power to do that. But if you're in relationship with someone in engagement with someone, I should say at your work or whatever, the appropriate thing to do is I want to say your name, right? Can you teach me how the, the appropriate way to say your name, because psychologists will tell you that one of the most beautiful sounds to any person automatically is the sound of their own name. So when we abstain by saying we don't want to get it wrong, we're actually committing an alternate offense in our good intention. And the book's entire framework is all about the presumption that we want to be good people. And these are the things that hold us back. And it's, it's a, I can't say it enough, a very challenging book challenging to digest it's very readable but it's concise and uh, and precise with its um uh, instruction and uh it leans on science and then shares anecdotes to back up the science but it's a powerful and affecting book and i highly recommend that anybody who cares at all beyond the superficial sort of uh talking points of actually doing and being and producing good things in the world around you to confront bias this is i think an essential book to read it'll hurt you but it'll help you a lot too it's called uh the person you mean to be by dolly chug and um i just finished it and will definitely be rereading it so that's mine re 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 reads re 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 reads <laughs> um hey vera have you have you seen ted lasso <laughs> <laughs> I have not, but Bill oh. Lawrence, the creator of Scrubs, um, he's the one that did Ted Lasso. Yeah. Scrubs podcast. They talk about it all the time. So I have been. You need to get on that. You need to get on that. Feel free um, to, to <clears throat> text me every so often. Hey, have you watched Ted Lasso? Yeah. I'll, oh, <laughs> the invitation is now accepted. Um, uh, <laughs> Well, I was, I wasn't going to, but I feel like I'll build on your, uh, building block there, Riri. Um, so I was going to offer my thoughts on Raya and the last dragon, but I didn't like it a whole lot. So I won't, but, um, <laughs> just spoiler alert. Uh, I did start reading. I'm not done with it at all, but, um, 
uh, the gentleman Thomas Merton, a uh, mystic monk, uh, American, uh, kind of, I don't know how long it's been since he passed away, but the heyday of his writings uh, were the 60s and 70s, I believe. But probably through Roar, I stumbled on a specific one of his books, which is called Seeds of Destruction, uh, which has a really like hope-filled and, you know, <laughs> lovely title there um i don't know if y'all are like this with your reading i am embarrassed to admit i'd probably do this more than i care see it's just confession time on the show today Apparently. where <clears throat> i will defer to more recent texts thinking oh well if i'm going to spend my time with this i want it to speak to kind of the moment i'm living in which and it's subconscious it's it and, and plays itself out consciously but it um it's, where I'm going with that is Merton specifically, I've got his book, Seven Story Mountain on my shelf for like 15 years. I've never cracked it open. Um, partly because it's just like, oh, well, it's memoir. And, you know, who knows if I'll get around to that. And there's this way I had cloistered him off and, and you know, folks who aren't in the last couple of decades or whatever, as speaking to a world that I don't live in. And then I cracked open Seeds of, Seeds of Destruction, which was written in um, about 62. And the first section of the book is, I don't have it in front of me, but it's effectively called Letters to a White Christian Liberal. And I was like, oh, snap, here we go. <laughs> and uh, then reading it and man, he, I don't know if you know much about him, but um, to, to say prophetic, and apply it to what he says in this section of this book is not uh, overstating what he does. I mean, he slices through um, to the heart of racial elements uh, that were active and present in the 60s that are active and very present today. Um, and it's it, it, it feels like he's dropping the mic every two pages on, you know, things like your white person your privilege keeps you from being the ally you think you are stuff like this and it's like oh my god um and i'll i'll, I'll end my little whatever with just a quote of his that it is not often that reading nonfiction, it is it is quite often i will read a piece of text a phrasing and just be like oh and write it down. You can ask my wife, you know, I'm laying in bed reading, huh? You know, little market, little audible, whatever's. It's not often I'm just like slack jawed when I hit a spot, like just, oh my God. But he ends one of these chapters uh, talking about all the ways white Christians have utterly missed the mark on uprooting uh, racial terror. <clears throat> and he says at the end of this chapter, Doubtless the mercy and truth of God, the victory of Christ are being manifested in our current history, but I am not able to see how they are being manifested by us. <laughs> I was like, oh God. <laughs> so yeah, Seeds of Destruction by Thomas Merton. Um, you're not the person you think you're always the name of What? A little light reading. A little light reading. Sure. You listen to this show, Vera. You know, I'm always talking about my wife's like, well, just come on go watch bluey i'm like i didn't know bluey was a thing now i will and we'll pick up the new stephen king or something yeah come on yeah 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 um so in the spirit of all of that let's lovely things up on our way out what's what's watching what's reading what's listening to awesome oh thank you little gaudy um so this is week two of what scares us and we uh uh are going to be you're you're the you're the person of the hour vera um <laughs> we're just gonna sit back we're gonna take a break yeah we're yeah let you uh run the show i did i i had asked you if it's okay that we share your submission and it, it feels weird to suggest i read this um when you are sitting right here uh so 
if you're open to it, I just texted you your submission. Are you are you open to are you open to reading this for us? Yeah, I can read it. So, listeners, a few minutes ago, Reed requested, solicited your continued submissions for the What Scares Us, uh, wherein you are sharing your story, uh, and we are either going to be sharing it on the show or covering what you share on the show if it's something we haven't covered. And this this was Vera's submission. So, Vera, if you're open to it, why don't you read away? What scares me dates back to grade seven when I was bullied horribly and spent a lot of recess time in the library reading. And I found this book on the shelf called Camp Zombie. And I vividly recall thinking that it looked way too scary to be in my middle school library. If you Google the title, it's by Megan Stein, S-T-I-N-E, no relation to RL, the cover with four zombies on it. Anyway, it looked too scary to be allowed in my then seven, uh, grade seven brain. And so I was definitely going to read it and did. And it freaked me right out and started a lifelong fear of swimming in lakes, specifically near docks for fear that zombies would get me. As I've gotten older, I've realized that it's not just fear of zombies in the water, but can probably be classified as thalassophobia or fear of deep bodies of water and what's lurking in them and submechanophobia, the fear of man-made things that are submerged. So yes, that's it pretty much. That's amazing. I learned two wonderful words there, <laughs> thalassophobia and submechanophobia, which sounds like mm -hmm. submecha like a high mecha honey. Sounds like, um, oh, what's that movie? With the robots in Japan. Can Pacific Rim? Yeah, sounds like one of those. <laughs> okay. yeah, that's like a Mac. Yes, a Mac. Yes. yes. Now, well, I Vera... looked up. Uh, I looked up Camp Zombie. Okay. And uh, sadly, is it on Disney Plus? It is. It is. No. Um, <laughs> sadly, it is um, out of print and somewhat difficult to find now, um, which makes it all the more endearing to me to actually try to seek out a copy of this book because the cover of it looks great. Have. If it's only ah. scary to grade seven me, but <laughs> <laughs> makes sense. Vera, but, would you yeah. would you cite this uh, story you shared and and reading this book specifically? Like, is that what beget your kind of life in the genre, as it were, or did it precede this? No, I'd say before that, my parents took me to um, Disney Florida. And huh? my dad took me on the Jaws ride when I was way too young to go on the Jaws ride. Okay. And that, <laughs> I'd say that was kind of my first touchstone with scary stuff. Okay. But still thalassophobia. I mean, I know, like still, the, ja yeah. <laughs> the, ja the Jaws ride, you still get like that, that, you know, <clears throat> something's lurking in the water. I had nightmares for months after that ride. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. Yes. Jaws it is. So, so in the spirit of that, because the, the tail end of your piece recommended, uh, or at least cited specifically the film 47 Meters Down um, uh, as toying with these notions. Yeah. And so that is clearly, if you're listening to this episode right now uh, in your feed, what we are talking about today. So it's funny. I... You, you have articulated with, with a great degree of specificity, <laughs> a level of um, nuance to, to a thing that I would, would echo up and down more generally. Like I wouldn't have known Thessala and Submecha um, to, to, to identify these things, but I think, I guess, speak speak generally, Vera, segue us into specifically 47 meters down is a good way to just kind of on-ramp us into that conversation. Like, are there, what about this one specifically? Because there's been plenty of like, you know, shark-esque films and, and, and people underwater, scary thrillers. Like, when you saw this, how did it stand out to you as compared to some of these other types? So I like sharks, like um, I watch all the shark movies, good and bad, terrible. Um, I just, I, I enjoy them. Um, 
but, and I know that sharks don't generally act in like the overly aggressive way of say this movie or the shallows. Like I understand that that's not normal shark behavior for the most part, but it's the, the idea that how, of how helpless you are when you're in the water because you can't breathe in their home. Like you need an apparatus to help you do that. You can't move the same way that you would when you're on land. Like it's all a lot slower. It's all a lot more difficult. Um, everything that lives down there <laughs> is just like pure muscle. And there's so many things that are just too big to be allowed. And then there's like the vast emptiness of the ocean. Like there's so much in it but it's also so vast and so empty and so unexplored. And you can just look out into blue in all direction and be completely lost. And I find that terrifying. <laughs> well, okay. So here's a, here's a good a, a, a sort of a question that, that is, is a good way to point us into this because it's fascinating Reed. I don't know if you've thought about this with regard to the, what scares a series. I don't know that there's been a much, more defined intentionality to actually unpacking the the in other words we usually use a film as okay here's the thing and right. uh what of that film and what present in that film kind of scares you a little bit versus right. what we're doing right now which is okay let's really uh, interrogate some of these notions as they apply to us specifically so sure kind of a, a question i was pondering as i was just thinking about this film and thinking about our conversation about it have y'all specifically as it relates to water and, and bodies of water, have you had experiences of that, that stoke the sphere that, that birthed the sphere or perpetuated the sphere? Is that, I mean, you know, I guess, I guess it's vulnerability time. Uh, I'll, I'll go first since I'm asking the question and, and didn't give y'all opportunity or, you know, you're just now hearing it. Um, I've had multiple instances now. I don't, I don't have enough of a conscious memory of my really younger years to know why this is the case, but like swimming lessons just never really took for me. I, I went through them multiple years over and, you know, I'm sure there's something uh, uh, deep rooted there, but it just never kind of stuck. And so because of that, there's already this ingrained like trepidation about bodies of water, but even using that as a generalized layer over this, there've been several instances over the years. Um, I can remember a, a summer camp where we were in some, you know, kind of uh, fresh water body of water and, you know, you're walking on the slimy rocks and all of a sudden there was nothing below me. Like, you know, you just, you, you're not over the rocks anymore. And I, I had this distinct memory of that. I remember, I remember being at, this is a wild one, I remember being at the beach with a good friend, <clears throat> uh, Lucas Schaefer, excellent gentleman in Columbus, Georgia, uh, entrepreneur, good guy, uh, elementary school chum of mine. And I went to the beach with his, he and his dad and another guy, and they were very avid ocean people and, you know, wanting to go out to the sandbar and that kind of stuff. And now at 41, I can say it intimidated the hell out of me to, to venture into that. And I, and for some reason I doubled back. Like I was like, ah, okay, I'm not. I remember what it was. Uh, I, I stepped on something, something to this day. I can remember it. It. I don't think something like a pincer got my foot, but but it, something sharp got my foot. It was not a bite. It was a uh, a pierce uh, towards the uh, heel part of my maybe right foot or so, and it alarmed me so much that I was like, yeah, going back to the shore. Well, mm -hmm. they kept going the buddies kept going. So I'm kind of by myself trying to get back to shore and I lose Jeez. my footing and oh, I lose yeah. my footing and it wasn't an undertow scenario. Thank God. But I had to, add, and I'm at that point in time, I was 11 or 12 and I had to like call out for a gentleman nearby who had a float of some kind being like, I'm not doing great here and got him to help me. Um, but this perpetuates through, my entire life. So just, I can remember distinctly just a year ago at, or, or whenever we did our last family beach thing, I, I can't remember if we did that or not. Anyway, the, the time is a little blurry of when this exactly happened, but watching my children, this is a whole new dimension. 
watching my children enjoy and embrace ocean play and y'all it freaking me the f out <laughs> seriously yeah. sitting on the beach thinking i hope they're gonna be fine i mean <laughs> like that level of anxiety because right, it right. was uh rocky waves which you know feeds that exhilaration if you're comfortable in it but if you're me sitting on the beach thinking this is why i don't like coming here <laughs> it's, <laughs> now it's a, got a whole new layer to it where i'm watching my kids play a little far out and hoping their uncle who's an excellent swimmer that's out there with them i'm like lord i i i leave this with you in this moment because <laughs> i am stressed the heck out anyway so asking that question of you guys have have there been and and you know uh, whoever wants to go next can but have there been scenarios in life again nothing as specific to what the film portrays but that you can cite um of a survival type moment that you encountered whether it was a body of water or otherwise but more in nature if you will was the, yeah. was the idea vera i'll defer uh unless you need a little bit more time to think of one uh no um so they i can think of a couple of things so anytime seaweed touches my feet <laughs> yeah every, everybody hates that it's the worst um i remember one time i was at a summer camp um a, a day camp and every tuesday they would take us to a place called professor's lake and one year we were swimming at professor's lake and um we all got called out of the water Keep in mind also, this, this is a, um, a sign language camp, sign language summer program. So half the kids there are deaf. Half of them are like, oh, wow. Um, Coda's like me or have siblings that are deaf. So anyway, there's like panic on the beach and they're trying to get everyone out of the water. But you're there um, as a youth or you're there as a. And I'm there as a youth. Right. I'm there as a camper, right, right. a kid. And so, like, I'm trying to get, you know, the attention of my friends who are deaf and stuff and be like, hey, we need to get out. Something's happening. And it turned out somebody had let their pet piranha loose in the lake. <laughs> <laughs> and so they had to evacuate the water. And what? then they had to go in. Yeah. <laughs> There's so <laughs> much wrong with that sentence. I was about to say, who has a pet piranha? <laughs> like, <laughs> this is like piranha. It's a thing. So they had to go in with like this special electrical rod thing. Oh, and like MJ. shock the fish Ooh. so that they would float to the surface and oh. go around looking for the piranha that somebody had like oh my face. gosh <laughs> not this one not this one <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> uh, that finger. one will be dinner <laughs> on the fish to the surface and then they'd have a couple minutes to look around and then they would have to do it again like it was that's insane yeah. we didn't get to swim for the rest of the day obviously um and then you know after i um so my fear developed and I, uh, scared. And then I went to, um, the summer camp that I still volunteer at Ontario camp of the deaf. And, um, they had a night swim for the staff and everybody knew mm -hmm. that I, I can't do what, like, I, I don't like lakes in general. Um, yeah. So they convinced me to go for a night swim and then had somebody like swim from under the dock and grab my leg. No. Yeah. And then uh, I cried obviously. And they felt really bad about it, but I was like, this is why I don't like it. Um, and yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, one other time where I think we were out in BC on a family vacation, British Columbia, and um, there was a lake with a drop off. And so my mom had given me goggles to swim, but like didn't tell me about the drop off. I don't think she knew about the drop off. And so I put my goggles on and I swim like, you know, five feet out and then it's just boom, nothing and black. And it's like Boy. the scene in the movie where she's right. like, the flashlight and she looks over and it's yeah. like this. Yeah. That's what it yeah. was like. And so, yeah. Oh, oh my God. Oh. <laughs> this conversation is so stressful. For yeah, me. it is. Like, it is. <laughs> so like, so my stories, one that I don't remember, but was told to me enough times, I guess when I was about three, I wandered and, and I was being babysat, but like at the time, at that moment, I was like not being closely monitored, I think either because they were making my lunch or whatever, but I, I fell into the pool and I don't want to speak ill of whoever this babysitter was because I was found quickly um, because clearly I, you know, the, I survived. I fell in the pool. I was probably only in the pool for like maybe a few seconds, but, um, but they quickly realized it, got me out of it. But apparently that made me very opposed at, uh, you know, as I was growing up to wanting to take swim lessons. I just got super freaked out by it. Um, eventually I can remember this one specific moment that I went over and this was in high school, one specific moment that I went over to like some friend's house at a pool and in the way that like 
some people just think it's hilarious. Hey, this individual has just walked in, you know, with a bunch of things in their pockets and clothes and everything. Let's throw them in the pool. Won't they love that? That will be hilarious. <laughs> so, so <laughs> just grabbed me and threw me in the oh. pool, but I couldn't swim. And so I distinctly remember they grabbed me, threw me into the pool. And I remember a few seconds later, them realizing, oh, shit. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and, like, and like, he can't swim. And so then just like, like pouring into the thing and like, you know, getting me out of there because I couldn't swim. And I was a good sport about it because I'm just like, oh, yeah, you guys are hilarious. Don't touch me. Don't talk. To me. So, you know. Never again. <laughs> but, Friendship's over. But that was like in high school. One other distinct memory that I have, and I cannot remember my age. I was probably like, I might have been maybe like seven or eight, you know, because you talk about like, Nathan, you talk about your kids doing like ocean play. Like it is a fond thing. And we do it with our son too, like to step out to safe distances in the water and like let the waves sort of crash over you and just sort of like, and, and sometimes when I was younger, I would still, even though I couldn't swim, I would like to go out far enough to where I could do what we called ride the waves. I don't know if everybody calls it that, but like basically when the waves come in enough, you're far enough out that the um, pressure and everything of the water lifts you up. Sure. But you quickly set your feet back down onto safe. Ground. Right. So you're not out too deep, but the waves are going to come in. They're going to pick you up and you're going to put back down. And that, that's a, that was a fun experience for me. Well, I remember there was this one time I was at the beach and the, the, I don't remember the context because I can't even remember how old I was, but I was, I was a young and I was probably like seven or eight, I want to say. And I remember I was out riding the waves with my uncle David and we were there and he was near me, but I remember there was one moment where like, you know, he was kind of encouraging me to kind of, you know, go out a little further and everything. And he's, he was an avid swimmer and he was encouraging me to kind of go out a little bit further. And I felt a little safe because I was with him, but as many people might have had a similar experience, we're riding these like low key waves and then suddenly a monster like sneaks a monster wave like sneaks right. up on it like, like not, not a, a real mon monster right not cthulhu you know so but, right. um, <laughs> you know, but, but like you know a big wave suddenly comes in and the what i remember is i remember seeing the height of the wave i can still picture that in my mind and being you know, mentally and emotionally, as well as about to be physically overwhelmed by like, that is a bit that I'm not going to ride that like, that's a big <laughs> way that was going to ride me glancing over and seeing my uncle. So, so the memory that I have is of my uncle's very quickly, like bracing and like turning towards me. But it all happened too quickly, the wave overwhelmed me and I like spun in the thing. So I was completely consumed by water, spun around under it, it couldn't have been more than about two or three seconds, if it was even that long before my uncle had me in like a bear hug. So that was what he was doing was turning sure. towards me to be like, I've got you, you know. Um, but there was this like, you know, two to three second gap where the waves overwhelmed me and I remember spinning. And what's cool about that, I mean, what I say is cool about that experience is I felt like abject terror for like a couple of seconds, but then my uncle was so close to me. It was, you know, very quickly a feeling of like reassurance because he could swim very well and he knew exactly how to, you know, sort of navigate this. And so uh, quickly got me back up. Obviously we went back out into the shore and it wasn't long before I was out playing again, but in general, like where I sit right now, the odd thing about like my swim range is if I'm in a pool, I can actually swim from one side of the pool to the other as long as I stay in motion. I can't tread water. If I try to tread water, I'm going to sink because I just don't know the mechanics of that and haven't taken swim lessons to try to learn. But I know enough about swimming that like if I'm in motion, I'm okay. But there's still this, what we've all described as this sort of like, if you look down and can't see what's there and this, this sort of like abyss thing, maybe I've watched too many movies. I don't know, but I just always imagine like, well, yeah, there's, you know, flesh eating jellyfish under here or something. I'm going to step on something. I'm going to step on the wrong thing, piss it off right good. And my leg's gone. That's exactly what's going to happen. And so I'm not, you know, that that's, that's always the way that I feel about it. Even when like, like the notion of a cruise, I find kind of fun and exciting, but, but it's, it's also like, Oh, uh, cause man, if something happens and I'm like, I'm not going to do well. <laughs> Well, if I have to do any swimming at it's all. Funny, it's funny you say that, and this will maybe pivot us into the text of the movie unless anyone has other stuff. So the the last story, and, and something that the film actually stirred up in me and reminded me of was 
um, and this is as an adult. So I don't know, three or four years ago for my work, we had hit some big sales goal or whatever. And we went to the Dominican Republic, which I'd never been to. And as part of some excursion one day, we did some snorkeling and, hmm. you know, like, so sales as a vocation is already this very like showy can be artifice driven thing. Well, so, so add to that a, a, a physical environment and scenario where I am not comfortable in, in, in my own skin and insecure. And I'm like, snorkeling, oh yeah, let's do that. That's going to be so fun, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and it should be this really lovely thing, but we had not done any like, it's like, uh, it's like Rapunzel in this movie, you know, she fakes that she'd done some lessons or whatever. I'm like, we, we haven't done anything. We haven't done the little thing to know what on earth to do. So, you know, you're pretending like you're, you know, you just put the thing in the thing and you put your back on the back and you just go in and just look down and swim around. Like, cool. I'm good. Yeah, I got this. And y'all just, just doing the most basic dumb stuff. I really should, you know, overcome this fear, but uh, work, work on that. But, you know, just, just being in what is a pretty safe body of water, but in the snorkeling setting, trying to put your head under the water and trying to, and you've got this, the breathing, you know, the, the oxygen tank on, like, it was so stressful. It was so mm. stressful. Uh, and you're just trying to play it cool. Like, no, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Really not happy with this moment, <laughs> but, but this can pivot us into the movie because so much of what one, I, we all need people in our, this is pivoting into the text of the film. If you, if you have seen the film, you know, this, if you haven't seen the film, it's about two sisters in a tropical setting who one sister is down on her luck. The other sister pressures her into a, a, a shark diving scenario in the cage thing and the cage comes loose from the boat and they sink as the title suggests 47 meters down mm -hmm. um onto the bottom of the ocean so you know one we all need people in our lives who can encourage us and push us through our fear but right. this sister sucks <laughs> i mean come on like the amount of peer pressure applied like here's the thing here I'll, I'll cut to the chase for me in the film i think the film itself is just okay it it is pretty thrilling as far as you know some of the scares and elements of it goes it it, it hits the beats you sort of need it to hit to have a, a kind of fun movie going experience but some of the some of the you know conventions of it like the script aren't real great uh but what's really funny is is it's like and movies like this and by like this i simply mean real distilled scenario like like what's the, what's <laughs> you know it's um it's freaky friday but horror you know okay what's what is your log line here it's like okay uh go and dive in in the cage and the cage comes loose and you get stuck on the bottom of the ocean okay oh god yeah that's scary let's <laughs> film that right it's real easy um but you it's need something that movie do what it's like a bottle episode of a yes, tv show totally, movie. totally totally yes. yes um except you're in the bottle <laughs> right so bottle. right um but so so in a in a structure like that you need something pushing characters into in deeper into their peril so i get it i understand mechanically uh, what was what was your word? Submechanicalism? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> I understand structurally how this story works, but what it does is just pisses me off towards this sister who is just like, no, come on, that's fine, you'll do it. I know you're in super deep anxiety over this thing, and you're not, you're not studied in it you, we didn't do the tutorial and i know you're kind of emotionally down but it'll be great oh these aren't jerks you know anyway i was just like man she is the worst <laughs> that's my that's my first opening solo on 47 nice. meters down <laughs> so so one of the things that's funny to me was apparently and i don't know this because obviously i don't go scuba diving or anything but no. as i was watching Good it thought one, after all of that <laughs> right one thing that um stuck out to me as I was like, okay, apparently this, this whole sort of like 
backdoor scuba diving excursion, utterly not professional, tiny little boat, everything. Apparently they have all of their funds into their headgear because they've got this really, was, like, yes. Like, yes. Like, like, like they've spent so much on it that they don't do maintenance on the winches and ropes. Okay. Like they've got this really high tech speaker that can hear each other really, really well and expel water and all this other. Guy. And I don't know enough about it. Never fogs up. Like, no, yeah. I'm like, wow, man, those are some really, Really high t- all you need to do is take like 10% of your budget, get some better, like rust free kind of steel on your cages. Well, then or you whatever. don't have a story, Reed. I know that's my that, that's the thing, but I just like you know, wow. it's really funny about you mentioning that is it made me think of um, because because I caught that, I thought about that in the watching, uh, in the most recent Mission Impossible when he does the um, the low gravity jump, whatever yeah, it's this, called, the sky jump. He, yep. he, mm-hmm. There's a name for it anyway. Uh, the mask he wears for the jumping i saw a behind the scenes thing with christopher mccrory who is the director and maybe screenwriter and they were talking about i don't know if you remember this if you saw the film it's lit like there's lighting in it yes a little blue and how that would not be actually present but you can't film a movie and not see tom cruise's face if he's in it (laughs) and so i thought about that with this movie i'm like i guarantee you the 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 upper level uh, technology <laughs> present in these masks is purely just because they need it it's not right, right not right. for the story it's for the production <laughs> yeah because otherwise actually, everybody it up yeah and, uh, and it's like stuff like um professional divers have an issue with the movie in oh that, oh like, it doesn't accurately depict some of the aspects of cage diving or um deep sea not deep sea but like um um diving as far as you can go which is like 40 meters is usually the benchmark for like free dive okay um, oh wow okay yeah and yeah and so those masks don't actually exist and people right. are just like, oh, <laughs> it's not real and i'm like yeah of course it's not real it's a movie you have to right see right yeah place. right <laughs> embrace the embrace the suspension of disbelief okay like just yeah. like this is the scenario um well what's and what's interesting is too like i remember thinking the film did for for as many things as I would fault the film for saying not doing a good job, I think the film did a really good job of heightening the stakes of the tension. Uh, you know, probably one of my main things, uh, one of my primary things that I would praise the movie for is like, yeah, it, it is terribly tense. Like it's very um, not every every aspect, every single time the camera turned into like an abyss of some sort and you see those little floaty Ugh. things come in whatever that was you know i think they bubbles like, chopped well no but they like chopped up broccoli to to make it look like when they were in the tank to right. make it look like yeah. you know organisms were swimming around in the water but you know that that moment that you're just waiting for it. you're just waiting like okay i can only see like excuse me a foot and a half ahead of her but i know any moment just teeth and mouth are going to just come soaring at the screen and that's just such a nerve-wracking experience um and also like that feeling like I could feel my heart sort of racing a bit when she's out there, she swam out there to be, uh, to, to find the flashlight and to presumably find Javier. That's terrible. And then she's looking around. She's like, I don't know which way to go back. I'm like, Oh my my God. That's the worst part of the movie for me. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know what I'd be. I thought about, because we've done it before on the show. I thought about, doing the whole when would you die game because but but i've got that question written down basically (laughs) yes yeah 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 i mean like any number any number of every turn yes i would just be (laughs) be over and done with over and done with um but yeah there's just there's just an incredible amount of it's like it's one of those things where like if i was you know skipping a little bit to the end i'll just touch this and go is that like you know if i was wrecking the if I was recommending the film as a general film, I might not recommend it. But if I was recommending it to like underwater shark enthusiasts, I'm like, yeah, it's, it's a super, super tense experience for that. So if that's what you're after on shark week, like, yeah, 47 meters down is absolutely in the, in the pocket for it. Um, yeah. It's a decent B movie shark movie. Like it's right, not a, right. a, it's not a bad shark movie and it's not mm-hmm. jaws, but it's, it's a decent watch. And if you right. have the yeah. specific fears that I have, then it's very scary. Absolutely. <laughs> So well, terrible. which which we all clearly share. Yeah. Um, <laughs> although I'll say this about the film that I do think sets it a, a little bit apart. We all keep subconsciously referring to it as a shark movie, but while the sharks are present and they are threat, 
it's not limited to just the sharks. That's I mean, a good point. Right. You know, the, water. The, what? <laughs> it's the water and your biology in the water. And yeah. You're yeah. not supposed to be there. <laughs> Vera, get, give us something off of, off of your list. Um, you know, the um, part, it's near the end of the movie. Spoiler. When <clears throat> this was in the trailers, it's not a spoiler. Um, when they're swimming up to uh, the surface and they've got the flares. Oh, yes. They're trying to, Great. Yeah. So they're swimming up and then uh, it's the, they drop the flare. They're on their last flare. She lights it and it's just three sharks like, rah. <laughs> and that's a, it's a really good jump scare. Yeah. It's, it, it's really great. And it reminds me of, um, you know, in um, Jaws, when he's talking about the USS Indianapolis. Oh, man. It's been a while, scene. but so fill it in. So um, it, this is an actual historic event. Um, oh, yes. So, but he, he talks about it in the movie. It's the ship that brought the, the bombs to mm -hmm. uh, Hiroshima and uh, it sunk. And it is the, the biggest shark attack on record. Um, and so the, the ship went down. Um, a bunch of people died with the ship. A bunch of people died from salt water poisoning and dehydration. Um, 316 people were rescued and the rest of them were eaten by sharks. <laughs> Um, specifically, they say in Jaws, tiger sharks, but it was the oceanic white tip. And um, and they said at night it was the worst because people would just be getting picked off oh my gosh. by the sharks in the middle of the night. Um, and they would just be gone and you'd never see them again. And so that specific scene in the movie where it's blackness and like, and they, you only see the sharks because they have the flare and light it and boom, three of them are there. Like, Oh my gosh, it's the most that was, a, that was a great moment. I did remember thinking, okay, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, well, and one of them, like they would be terrifying if even if they were just sort of sitting there watching, like, hey everybody. But like <laughs> one of them when she when she cracks the flare, one of them has its jaws like wide open. Like you you would think had she not hit the flare, they would have had a second and a half before they'd be gone. Because its its mouth is like open and primed. And which they is wouldn't have seen it coming. <laughs> no. And that's just oh my gosh. Well and, and that's one thing that the film I think of the moments the sharks are seen in the film, I think for every you know one minute that you can see the shark coming, there are probably two or three moments where you see them rush into frame as they're about to attack. And that is, that is just so unnerving in it, just incalculable ways. So yeah, it's, it's definitely like, I, th I think Jaws or even, you know, like the, the, the rapid amounts of fascination with Shark Week and movies like this and everything like that have in general probably given sharks a much maligned reputation that they don't necessarily deserve in terms of like like you pointed out earlier um they're not as aggressive animals as they are typically displayed on film um but it's just i think there's something about their power and something about their size and something about their their ability to so precisely navigate and and just the the effectiveness of their predatory nature um just positions them perhaps unfairly if we were just looking at the scope of nature, but positions them as like prime predators of like, okay, yeah, these are, these are the guys that you don't want to mess with. <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that Reed, Cause I don't remember what it was. It might've been like a national geographic, something or other, but a couple of years ago we were watching some documentary style special featuring, you know, uh, marine biologist type folk who were decrying, who were, who were working to basically reform the PR on sharks, mainly saying yeah. because of media, not only has it increased the negative and fearful bias against them, but it has also increased aggression towards them from humans. Uh, Interesting. When in fact, to your point that you were trying to make, however, intentionally or not, yes, they are powerful beasts. And yes, there are degrees to which they, by their fearsomeness, can run afoul of our fears. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's kind of like, um, I was watching something recently where it was talking about, honestly, pandemics as dour as that is, but that, that, societal encroachment on nature 
is what exacerbates pathogens in the world mm. and and that basically this thing was saying this this news feature was talking about um it was john oliver actually but was talking about how um the the risk of faster sooner more frequent pandemic style seasons is our fault because of how wow. much we encroach upon nature and so pivoting that back to the shark thing it was she was basically saying like we it's like grizzly man the Werner herzog movie it's like we right. aren't leaving them alone and and because of uh population densities and because of sticking around the beaches too long and ex and expanding our footprint as it relates to the beaches and thus we're in parts of the ocean we weren't previous you know like it just keeps we're running into them not them running into us you people, know people people who think pet piranhas are right yeah. <laughs> yeah. like like, and like no i'll just dump it in the lake i don't want it anymore yeah. <laughs> like, oh yeah but i mean like that 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 i think is a really substantive kind of thing like like one of the things that again for as much as i would kind of if i were in this mode for as much as i would kind of like knock this movie for there's a couple of interesting things just in the dna of its premise one of those being that like this is very much a self-inflicted predicament that they've put themselves in. You know, this is not like in contrast to a movie like Jaws, where there is an encroaching sort of predator that has made his way in and you've got to find a way to deal with that problem that they didn't, you know, they didn't cause this issue. Obviously, it's all fiction. But in this situation, they're like, no, you you went into the water in a very rusty cage and you know the rope snapped and and now you're at the bottom running out of oxygen all these things and it did strike some chords in me about the ways in which we ourselves we talked before on the show uh actually on the vast of night conversation about getting in over our heads and i'm not going to rehash that conversation beat for beat but just that notion in in which we will very very quickly put ourselves out of our depth and we're having a, you know, this point of the conversation right now is the way that we've maligned sharks as a society or, you know, the, in our thought process. But at the same time, they just, what is this thing? What is this thing? Hmm, smells, smells interesting or whatever. It's like, they're, they're not doing anything inherently wicked, evil, or wrong. They're just fulfilling their natural instinct that is theirs to do. And it, it is really to a degree to us that we've put ourselves in that position. And I think that is, is fascinating to me. We haven't brought it up yet in this conversation, but I want to, in a second, give Vera a, maybe a, a, a lead in to talk about this part of it. But this film, in a way that other diving movies hadn't addressed, to my knowledge before, they can't rise to the surface quickly. And the reason they can't rise to the surface quickly is they call it the bends. Nitrogen bubbles get in your head and, and, and causes all kinds of of problems, you could die. Um, you could massively hallucinate. Uh, I, I, sincerely, Vera, you had mentioned this when you were talking to it about it. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I just hit like a couple of the highlights, but <laughs> yeah. Um, before I get into that, so touching on what you had said, how they they brought this on themselves by getting in the rusty cage, by going into it. Even before that, they chum the water. Right. Legally, right. 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 Something right. that you're not supposed to do. So they invite the sharks to come and be in, in close proximity to them so that they can go into their home and um, enjoy their presence, whatever the case may be. Right. But they they illegally do this. Um, right. And uh, entice the sharks to attack. And even though we know that that um, even great whites typically aren't this aggressive and they don't like people like we're not their favorite food type we don't have enough fat we're not the they don't like um iron blood they like more the fish coppery blood mm -hmm. and uh but they don't have hands to test their food they test with their mouth that's how they test what food is right mm -hmm. and when like a three thousand four thousand pound animal that's pure muscle comes and takes Goodness a test gracious. bite out of you it's gonna hurt <laughs> um right but we can all, we also know that um to your point that um we don't need to to be as afraid of them as we are normally for the most part, even though, you know, a test bite is going to hurt, it might not kill you, but it, it'll maim you probably like her leg towards the end of the movie um, that they won't attack like they do in this movie or like in the shallows, right? Like that kind of aggressive shark um, 
overly aggressive shark doesn't exist because the cal caloric expenditure that they use to try right. and catch prey that's not worth that in return mm. is going to kill the shark <laughs> <laughs> wow. and they're designed to survive, right? Um, yeah. So um, back to the way that your biology gets messed up underwater. So there's two conditions that are brought up in the movie. So the first is that you can't rise quickly to the surface because you'll get the bends, the nitrogen bubbles in your brain. The second one is the nitrogen narcosis, which oh, is right. when it gets in your blood and causes you to hallucinate, basically like, you've, like you're drunk, you've consumed too much alcohol and then you start hallucinating. Mm. Um, so those are the two things. Um, the bends is, is going up too quickly and then the pressure that causes inside your head and the nitrogen narcosis is um, just being under the water too long and, and I guess an over oxygenation in your, your blood from wow. the tanks, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And that's terrifying. <laughs> that is terrifying yeah. that being in the water can really mess you up like that. And the bends is, is typically, um, I remember reading a book on Jacques Cousteau, who was a, a mm. famous diver and explorer. Yeah. And I specifically remember a page on the bends where the, of a diver who's like rising to the surface, like, and, and, um, hunched over, and is supposed to be suffering from the bends. Like I remember this from oh, yes. four or five, this picture because of the description of, of how dangerous that is. And, and Jacques wow. Cousteau himself suffered from that one time. And it's very difficult to recover and that's often permanent. Um, whereas nitrogen narcosis mm. is reversible, but you see what it does to her in the movie where she hallucinates um, right. whole scenes, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like, well, and that's, that's something that we should, you know, cause we spoil things on this show. That was one that was one thing, and I wrote it down under scares because of how much it kind of like you know it, it was it was one of the big real gut punches to me of the movie because I kind of I kind of presumed okay some, somebody's gonna make it out or maybe like other shark movies they won't make it out and that's the lesson don't don't go diving in rusty cages or something you know but um, when they make it on the boat and there's that shot, you know they and the, the shark has come and grabbed them like three times. <laughs> And then they still Rob was like, if Mandy Moore still has her leg after this, that's <laughs> right. if Bethany Hamilton on a surfboard just has her arm dangling and it's gone. Tell me the right. shark comes three times and she's still got a leg. <laughs> she's still got the leg, you know, like, come on. But that was in um, her contract. <laughs> I can't lose the leg. Yeah. Um, but there's that shot where they're laying and their heads are together and her and her sister are laying on the boat. And they're laying down and the, the folks on the boat are like taking care of them and everything. And she looks up at her hand. And I remember thinking when she's watching the, the blood like sort of drift off into the air, I was like, oh, wow, she got out just in time. Like she's already starting to, to hallucinate a little bit. And that's when the film when the film pivoted and it goes from her looking at her hand up mm -hmm. against the sky to suddenly flashing back down in the cage that she was never able to escape from in the first place. And you realize the last like 30 minutes of the film has been a pure hallucination that she's had because she suffers from that uh, nitrogen, uh, was it narcosis? narcosis? What? Yeah. Nitrogen and narcosis. Nitrogen narcosis that is causing her to hallucinate. And um, obviously in the way, and, 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 and perhaps it would be fair of me to, to you know, ask if there's any more superficialities, but I had something that was somewhat more thematic that I'd like to introduce if if we're all game, if we're all down for it. But if there's any other trivialities that we just need to get out of the way, I want to yield to that. The last triviality is just how like a, a drinking game you could play on when most likely Mandy Moore says it's over, <laughs> and you're like, no, no, it's not. Literally, y'all. A line like that would get uttered, and I'd check the time on the movie. I'm like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> We're in know. this for a while. <laughs> but you like clockwork. meters down. Girl. Yeah, yeah. You are. You stay in down. <laughs> <laughs> but like, so, so what the what the premise sort of evoked in me is obviously this notion of you could layer in all these. There's God. There's several different things, and then I have a kind of a question. Um, there's there's the idea of 
you've gone too deep. You've gone beyond your depth, and now you're now the pressure is just too thick. You're you're beyond your depth. You're gonna run out of air because there's you're you're not in a place to where you can get back into level playing field with yourself. You're out of your depth. In that depth, you are um, as we've already talked about in sort of meta ways. You're maligning natural things as evil things when they're where the when in point of fact maybe they are just the natural extension of what's going to happen when you've gone out of your depth. Um, but also this notion of like rising to the surface too quickly, that causing a risk to you of possibly not only dying, but also of imagining entire scenarios that are not real and that are not true. And um, so much of that is inherent in the metaphorical nature of this premise. The question that I had kind of written down that I'll put out on the table is, you know, the 47 meters down of the title what do we fear more that the, the pressure is going to build up and we're going to not be able to sustain ourselves because we've gone too deep that the things that are out there in the water are really going to get are really that there really are boogeymen in our closet or there really are monsters in the water and that we should really be afraid or that we're going to try too hard to, in my metaphor, rise to the surface, or as I would put it, be too, reductive be too superficial about big deep and complex things to where we start believing or seeing reality in blatant falsehoods like which is the biggest threat to us as we're looking in our, navigating our world our life society everything like you know they're all threats to a degree but kind of what's the the biggest danger that's what i'm exploring in this uh in this film kind of coming outside of it. So I'd invite thoughts or I can unpack it a little further if you need more context. Yeah. Anything? No, you go. <laughs> so <clears throat> Reed, at risk of offense, um, I'm going to transfer, I'm going to yes and your, I just did like a Ryu Harukan sort of street Whoa. fighter move there, but trying to redirect, Harukan. taking the energy you're putting out there and transforming it because something that has stuck with me the last four or five minutes that you kind of just re kind of positioned in a, a fresh way was um vera's comment about the image of the diver in the jacques Cousteau book and something that i think is really fascinating is because what you just positioned Reed is, and, and I'm, I'm sort of restating my hearing of the question is what's, what's more worth our fear? You know, what, what, mm, how mm, would you, right, how would right. you rank you? You didn't say, how would you rank these? But the idea of like, what, what, which of these sort of manifestations of fear most uh, paralyzes you and yeah, what's the biggest risk. Right. And I think what sticks out to me as I sort of think about our encroachment is is here's what's fascinating to consider and it'll be specific and then we can apply it more universally <clears throat> there are people who can do things like whether it's scuba dive well um swim with sharks dive to the depths of the ocean the jacques cousteaus of the world what i'm trying to articulate here is it's our entitlement that puts us at risk it's our assumption that any environment we are fine in wow yeah when in point of fact the world can be lived in and occupied and cared for with grace and intentionality if you will set yourself to intentional care of that world. Mm -hmm. Meaning, the people who know how to do this, why, why do they know how to do it? It's because they've studied their butts off, mm -hmm. they've practiced, they comprehend the risk. Right. 
that life itself is risk, you know, me sitting on a beach on a beach freaking out because my kids are playing in the ocean. Like that's just that's just an acute version of what we all kind of walk around with, you know, some version of psychological anxiety that we live in a world that can, you know, that we're not fully equipped to uh, encounter every everything that will come against us. But my point is simply like it's when we when we disrespect take for granted and assume an ownership that isn't ours to assume versus conscientious, intentional application of wisdom into spaces in which we recognize our place in that space. Does that make any sense at all? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's just really fascinating to ponder that, like, you know, this, this notion of assigning, aggression and negativity to sharks it's because we're ignorant <laughs> i mean yeah, really right uh, and and because uh, uh Vera, you said a minute ago about um the the taste mechanism you know the 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 exploring your food mechanism like that's a very oh yeah that makes perfect sense mm -hmm. now it's scary as hell if you're ever the poor soul who's in that moment but from a rational, comprehensible standpoint, I can understand that and I can reckon with that and I can know that, okay, well, it's, I, I, I don't know if, if I'm making exactly the sense I think it made in my head simply to try to articulate. It's when we lock ourselves in the rusty cage of our ignorance and entitlement and, and, and plunge ourselves into environments we're not equipped, not knowledgeable, not respectful of that we are utterly at the peril of all these dreadful risks when in fact you could be down there in full comfort and security if you just do the discipline to be able to engage in that environment well and and i would say because i want to i want to hear vera's thoughts on this too but i i also what immediately came to mind is kind of an additional question of <laughs> that Jeff Goldblum from Jurassic Park is like muttering in my head of you were so interested in figuring out whether or not you could, you didn't stop to think if you should. And I couldn't agree more that it is our entitlement, which puts us into positions where we don't produce the care that we should to be in those environments. I also ask of myself, should, should we even broach the environment like uh, in other words you could say there's two responses to what you've just identified about like hey it is our arrogance that has said we will be fine we are the masters of our domain and we will be the masters of this domain as well that's arrogant and and hubris at its height but then the question becomes of like okay well should you even venture out into that space should you do the homework to try to venture out into it um carefully tactfully cautiously respectfully because to a degree that is also a form of encroachment and i guess i would ask of myself i'm not necessarily asking it of everybody though i'm inviting responses is what we're really touching on are the ethics of exploration and we live in a world right now where exploration is not only uh, happening, it's, it's vital in a lot of ways for us to explore the new territories that we have boldly and arrogantly, because we just sort of rushed into it, thrust ourselves into, like the effects technology has on, on our, our own personal well-being, the interpersonal relationships and the ways that um, you know history and, and decades and decades and even hundreds of years in some cases of history have positioned us right now to try to explore tricky and complicated issues of how we live together and how we relate to one another and all of those kinds of things. So exploration is kind of thrust upon us. What are those ethics supposed to look like you know like how should we even i'll say it, i'll say it this way to to hopefully refine a bit more i i hear you and just want to like amen the whole it is our arrogant entitlement that thinks we're going to be safe in that environment and my cautious fearful self is like yeah i'm not going in the water <laughs> y'all have fun <laughs> like i'm not going in the water i'm just staying out of it and I wonder if that is also 
a bad instinct on my part to not engage it out of fear of being too arrogantly entitled in my engagement of it. So it's, it's a wrestling thing that I'm dealing with. So I would <laughs> drop the bomb on and then just be like, y'all, <laughs> y'all pick it up. <laughs> um, yeah, I like what you're both saying. Um, I echo that I think as Christians, we acknowledge, and I think non-Christians too acknowledge that we are stewards of the world that we live on, right? And yeah, it's important yeah. that we take care of it. And um, I would say that God has commanded us to do that, to take care of the world. And we have mm. not done a good job of that, right. um, especially in regard to our oceans and the shark population. Like it's right. been decimated. Um, so, um, and then in the movie, there's some pretty great examples of, so um, chumming the water, right? Training the sharks to come to a boat, which could cause hazards for people and that kind of thing. Um, in addition, like the ocean, there's so much ocean on our planet. There's so much water. Um, and we've only explored such a small amount of it. Like we don't right. know that much about this, the what's under the surface of the water. And that's mm. part of the terrifying thing, but 80% of it, we don't know yet. We haven't explored. We haven't mapped it out. Like we don't know what is down there. And wow. the, the ignorance of, of people to just say, but you know what? Um, I'm not going to go into this ecosystem to, to learn about it. Right. I'm going to go in it for the gram. I'm going to go in it to make yep, Stuart right. jealous. I'm going to go in it because of the peer pressure and going into this hostile environment that we are not meant to, to be submerged in mm -hmm. and then be surprised when you end up out of your depth, literally 47 meters down in this movie. Right. But um, you're setting yourself up to, to be put over your head and you're setting yourself up to, um, because you are not stewarding and taking care the way that you are supposed to, you're not taking the precautions, you aren't learning. Mandy Moore goes in without taking a scuba class, without knowing anything about what she's getting into, she goes into it and then literally ends up over her head. And I think that's an excellent metaphor right. that um, when we rush into something without knowing about it, without caring about it, without providing care for it in the way that we're supposed to do, um, we're not surprised when, or we should not be surprised when um, situations end up like that. Right. And it's like one, I apologize, just something she said, just like struck me, this notion that like, they're going into it for all the wrong reasons. And here's exactly the thought that struck my head. They got into these depths for such superficial reasons. Like you talk about like making Stuart jealous and everything like that. It's like they've, they've plunged this, this depth, but their reasons are so trivial. Like it would have been so easy to just be like, nah, I don't, I don't need that photo. There's other ways that I can try to salvage my relationship. And what's the first thing the shark takes away from them is the camera. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, they fall it through the thing, and then that's the first thing that it comes up and consumes. And I think in lots of ways, like, obviously, I mentioned that book up top, so a lot of the, the, the notions that that book challenged me on are revolving around in my head of the way people want, care more about appearing like an ally than actually being an ally, right. for which they may receive no glory. Um, and, and there have been contexts in which I think there can be ways, like in this film, where you plunge into something that is super volatile, super dangerous, but you're not entering into it with the, the, the care. I'll go back. To, we're not talking about Jurassic Park, but I'll go back to that line <laughs> that Laura Dern has in it where she's like, you've got these really poisonous plants in here for decoration. Like there's the, these are living beings that will protect themselves if necessary. And you've just made them a prop, you know? And I feel like in a lot of ways, we do not approach the things in our lives. And I'm of course have been referencing societal issues, but you could easily apply it to parenthood, being a spouse to the, the care and upkeep of your close personal relationships and friendships, the, the, the way you approach your day job, any of it, that um, if you do these kinds of things and suddenly are sort of juggling dynamite, if you will, 
but for purely superficial reasons so that you can receive like the little like button and go viral and all of this kinds of stuff, um, then you are very, very quickly going to get super far out of your league and are not going to have the maturity and the depth to know exactly how to swim your way through this. You're going to be in desperate peril at, at every single turn. You're not going to, you're not going to be equipped to really know how to navigate it. And I feel like that's where a lot of damage gets done. And I feel like a lot of um, hardships get exacerbated because people decided, Oh, I'm a, smart, sharp, savvy, grown adult. I'm an adult. I can make my own choices. And then you pretty soon the rope has snapped and you're completely in over your head. And there's no way to wind back the clock to just not get into the cage, to not put yourself into, into the condition. And I think the balance for myself before I'll shut up or pause or whatever is just in recognizing like, no, I, I, I love uh, Vera, you, you kept bringing up stewardship. And I think that's really what it comes down to is, is appropriately understanding the stewardship to which we're called in any arena that we're going to approach. Like, hey, you have to be a good steward of this. And that's really challenging. It might be understandable when we talk about the environment. And it might be understandable when we talk about interpersonal race and gender relationships. Oh, <laughs> but, but what a, what a just <laughs> moment. Hmm. I thought it was me. Like I thought that my nope. end froze. I like... saw your eyes blank and then uh, he was gone. I was like, well, hmm. We'll, we'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> he got lost out there. Uh, yeah, bro. <laughs> Reconnecting. <laughs> there he is. Welcome back. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, my internet totally like what was funny is I was talking and yep. on my on my end y'all began to react to my not talking. <laughs> so, oh. so I could still see you go, oh, well. And then Vera's like, I thought it was just me. And I'm like, what just, what just happened? Uh, yep. so, no, all, uh, all, I was, all I was saying, and I'll try to be brief about, uh, briefer about it, is we are also stewards of like our time and our personal relationships. And we have only been given like that that much of a thing and it's important that we have in our mindfulness just being a good steward of whatever we are um lest we find ourselves proverbially 47 meters down without any hope of of navigating it or getting back to the surface where we feel more in control um and uh, and that's just kind of one of several things that's been sparking as we've been talking about this is just this you know, having a greater passion for stewardship and having a greater passion of approaching the things in our life with much more tremendous care and intention than we tend to do. Our conversations, um, our relationships, our, again, the ways we spend our time. Um, anyway, all, all of that, it's just, it sparks a lot. Hmm. Nathan, what you, do you have anything more that, that, you wanted to kind of i mean or extrapolate no I, I i think i think i'm doing a uh i don't know if i'm doing a great job articulating but there's something forgive the pun just below the surface that i can see and i'm trying to to verbalize in the spirit of I think stewardship is appropriate and I think an attitude and spirit of stewardship is, is not just appropriate, but like necessary and, and, and right and good. But to me, there almost feels like, um, 
the, the idea of a hostile environment came up and maybe I'm naive, but what is, what is sparking in me and in, in relation to that idea is Reed, you started us off in the, you know, an hour and a half ago about this book you're reading and bias. And, and I would say, I don't know that it's a hostile environment. I think it's a hostile environment because we disrespect it and because we walk in without care or intention. It's it, ultimately it's morally neutral. And beyond that, it's beautiful. We just mm. abuse and colonize beauty out of the world. And that sucks. Yeah. And so this is what I'm trying to say is, yeah, I don't want to swim with sharks, but there is a world where I could dedicate my life to, or portions of it to learning how to do that. I.e. it's not just, hey, care for the environment, which is right and good and appropriate. Absolutely. And climate change is real. Like, come on. But it's taking those, it's taking those, it's taking assent to a certain philosophical idea and figuring out practically what that means in expression. Um, and and I, I, I don't know, I can't let loose the notion that it's not they enter a hostile environment because they've chosen for it to be hostile. They have stirred it up. They have exacerbated things they're ignorant of and, and plunge themselves into it. It on its own isn't that. And so I think there's some weird takeaway that I'm having a hard time wrestling down of how we, it's about our position and posture to the world. Mm. And, and are we, owners and and exercise supremacy over aspects of and or the whole world or are we participants and pieces of and you know walking in the cool of the day in an eden that we have like sauron raised to the ground in service of Wow. our own self-interests. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but it, it's something that's just keeps stirring up in me of like, it's not that you can't go 47 meters deep. It's that you have to know what you're doing and you have to understand the scenario and environment that you're engaging. And, and so many of us operate as though the world is our friggin' oyster and get surprised when that oyster snaps our arm off. It's like, cause you don't know what you're doing. Anyway, you, can't, yeah. you can't go 47 meters deep. Free dive limit is 40 meters. Mm. So they're mm. like they're deeper than where they're supposed to be because of their ignorance. Sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I think that's to, <laughs> this is a silly little. Do you remember the old um, rhyme? I forget exactly who wrote it, but if it's you sprinkle the... when you tinkle, please be <laughs> wet the seat. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> Talking about getting out of my depth. <laughs> <laughs> I was right in there. I didn't realize I was talking to Nathan Rouse. And then like, oh, no. Hey, you guys remember the little limerick, a uh, little rhyme, little, little What's rhyming couple from Nantucket. Um, so, <laughs> so um, no, the it's the um, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful. The Lord God made them all, and then there is a version of that, and I cannot remember where I heard this. But there's a version of it where it said, um, all things uh, bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, but man prefers a mall. And it was a, supposed to be Oof. some lesson. Yeah, some lesson about how like we've entered into the creation. Have you, uh, uh, you guys have probably not seen this movie. Have you guys ever seen Evan Almighty? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. I saw so, Bruce. I didn't see Evan. So Evan Almighty, I think, is actually got it's it's a lesser objective movie than Bruce Almighty is, but has, I think, more substantive lessons to impart in its themes than Bruce Almighty did. One of the moments in Evan Almighty is God shows Evan a landscape. He's looking out over this one thing and he shows him the landscape before man touched it. 
and and says like, oh yeah, look, I paid very careful attention to the way the light would hit when it came at this particular moment in time, you know, and then it goes back to the way that it was when man touched it. And it's like, oh, wow, this we've severely diminished it is the right. point of the, you know, that moment. And, um, and I think, you know, obviously we're, we're talking about a lot of weighty and lofty things about care and, and, and stewardship. And, and, uh, and I do feel like the other, the other element of it that I would say, and then I think it, it sort of expends uh, my thoughts on it, is this notion of how the hallucinatory effects that she endures, like the ways that we not only can barge into environments that we make hostile because we've not taken the time, we've not done the work, we've not put in the effort to really care for it the way that we need to, plus we're entering into it for very superficial reasons, and the ways that that can distort our perceptions of everything. Um, and the way that we can begin, this is, again, just something I'll hit and run, doesn't necessarily need to be an unpacking point unless it sparks something that you really want to. Um, I am very sensitive when people address complex issues reductively. As a general rule, I'm very sensitive to that kind of thing whether it be debating something on social media or expressing back to me a thing of like, Oh, well, Reed, you just, you're just trying to do this. And I'm like, no, it's a lot more complex than that. Like it's, it's, it, you've just uh, addressed me very reductively, or you've just addressed the, the issue in an oversimplification. And one of the last things that I thought about for this movie is the way in which like, that rise to the surface, that bends kind of thing, like that rise to the surface. Um, and I think that's a little different than the nitrogen narcosis specifically that causes her to hallucinate, but the ways in which that um, has distorted her view of reality and the ways we are also at risk of, you know, embracing falsehood in the way we navigate those things because we haven't put in the work We've gotten in out of our depth and now in an effort to sort of like rise back quickly into some version of something we can control, we're completely miles and miles away from where we should be in understanding the reality of our situation, miles and miles away from where we should be in understanding how to, uh, you know, be a good spouse, how to be a good parent, how to uh, be a good friend, how to be a good steward, how to be, um, forgive the language, I'm just being alliterative, a good Christian, a, a good uh, person in the world around you. And like, we're miles apart from that because we've sort of plunged the depths, got out of our league, and then tried to get in a very, you know, rapid fashion just into a more, well, it, it basically boils down to this. It, it you know, it, 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 it all just sums up like this. And, uh, and, and in our oversimplification and in our reduction, we've uh, trivialized it into a blatant falsehood. And uh, that's also on my mind, perhaps because of the books I've been reading, uh, perhaps because of this movie, I don't know, but that's, that's what's on my, on my head. I, um, I want to uh, give Vera an opportunity, especially as we sort of like round the corner to possibly wind down, uh, if there's any other aspect, trivial, substantive, or otherwise, that you wanted to bring up about this film or about this discussion. So uh, have the floor. Yeah, um, just to, to um, what you just said, um, I just wanted to bring up that 47 meters isn't that far when you think about it. Mm. On land, mm. it's... I just Googled this, so I'm going to say it in miles because you are an American podcast. It's <laughs> 0.029204 miles. Like it's, it's nothing. You can walk that wow. so quickly, right? Wow. Yeah. But when you are literally out of your depth, when you have gone too far, when you haven't done the work, when you've done things for superficial reasons and you've ended up in a situation that is now a catastrophe because you put yourself there. Wow. Right. Yeah. And going up, you can't get out of it, even though it's not far, but you've mm. overwhelmed yourself to the point where even that distance can hurt. It, it's going to hurt you. You might start believing your lies. You might start hallucinating. You, you don't know where you came from, where you're going. Right. Mm. You spin around once and you're completely lost. Right. 
and it's not that far down. It doesn't take much to get there. Wow. Yeah. That I mean that's, that's really yeah, that's really profound. I was I've been listening I've been I've been listening recently to the catalog of Rich Mullins, who was a CCM artist who died about almost uh almost thirty years ago now at this point. But um the, wow. Yeah, about 25 years ago he passed away. Yeah, it was like 96, 95. 96, 97, somewhere, there. somewhere in there. Yeah. But um, but he has a song. I mean, it just honestly, your little factoid there has just sort of knocked me over emotionally and mentally because he has a song that's called "We Are Not as Strong as We Think We Are." Mm, and it's a good song. That's such a it's such a beautiful song. It's a wonderful song. But that simple truth of recognizing that 47 meters down is nothing it's nothing distant, you know, it's like, it's one thing to think we can presume, Oh, well, we won't get out of our depth when we think out of our depth is a mile away. That even still feels digestible. No, no, no. 0.29 is too far. And the, the, the way that speaks to our fragility and the way that speaks to the necessity of how quickly we can be overwhelmed and how, quickly we can get out of our depth and how much more so we should treat with care any of the environments that we sort of want to dig further into or explore. No, that's a, that's a very, very powerful fact. Um, so thank you for messing up my life for the next, however many. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would like to uh, asterisk something you said there, Vera. I don't, I don't, I don't, think, I don't consider us an American podcast. I think we're a, <laughs> we're a kingdom your, podcast your sister. Yeah. <laughs> Do what? Wrong is what yes. our, our what <laughs> our metrics are wrong metrics. sure <laughs> exactly our, or are yours i mean I don't know. <laughs> we're out of our depth we're yeah, out of our depth. Yes. Quick, oh, quick. Whoa. rise to the surface oh, not too quick <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, i'm out of my depth <laughs> yeah. oh my gosh um so uh sh shall we three shall. traverse to the fog meter let's swim to okay? the surface let's swim to the surface so um okay. What was that? No, slowly. slowly. Take a decompression break. Ooh. Like, just wait. Five minutes. <laughs> um, so uh, our fog meter is our very, uh, you know, patent pending metric on how we rate these films according to their scares and their substance, uh, or in our particular vernacular, fear and God. Um, so I think I'll start with the fear measurement. Um, and I think I will... The, the thrills and the jumps are real and the existential and natural dread that arises from this film is pretty pervasive. So I'm going to land on the fear measurement on a, on a seven for 47 meters down. Vera, what would you say? Because this is specifically my fear. <laughs> well, 11. Yeah. Um, so, and and uh, yeah, I'm going to go nine because mm. yeah, scares the poop out of me. Mm-hmm. Nathan, what would you say? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are a few more um, things that scratch at real world existential and, and existential and literal fears than something in this ballpark. So uh, I'm going to uh, join Vera at the nine. All right. Uh, and what would you say, Nathan, for the God factor? Um, I think that inherent in the survival aspect of it, it's, it, you know, just the, the nature of this type of story is going to have embedded in it some man against nature, man against self, woman against nature, woman against self type of elements to it. That said, I think the movie is pretty just uh, given the nature of it on the surface. I, I don't know that there's a lot. I'm really not. I really don't mean to keep making these puns. <laughs> not a lot of depth there. Um, so I don't know. I think I think uh, substance wise, it's it's more like a four. It's a bit more cautionary tale than than uh, thoughtful examination. Yeah, yeah. What would you say, Vera? Uh, yeah, I think that it sparks some great discussion discussion here. But I think that um, we are thoughtful people, and <laughs> we can find. Um, things to discuss that are um, maybe elements of what is there, but aren't intentionally there. And I think it's just more of a, a survival movie and a man against woman, two women against nature movie. Um, so I'm going to join Nathan at a four. So. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll sit in that same pocket. I think it's intention as a film 
is to uh, thrill and give you the frights and 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 just sort of push that button of spook factor. So I'll 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 join you on that four, um, and that means that we give the movie forty seven meters down. Hang on, I have to do a little bit of clever math here we give it a six out of ten <laughs> i'm used to doing it by twos and it's not right so um yes so we give it a six out of ten on ye old fog meter uh which is a very you know uh, it's a reasonable showing um but the other big question and i'll start with you vera is would you recommend 47 meters down uh yeah i think that if you like um person against nature movies if you like, like shark movies this is definitely one of the better quality ones and um, if you have a fear of the ocean or deep bodies of water, um, go into it cautiously, but I think <laughs> it's enjoyable and I do recommend it. Awesome. What about you, Nathan? Um, I actually did a double feature of this uh, with our last week's film, Pumpkinhead. And I, I don't know, I had a I had a good old time with both of them. Um, <laughs> I like a 30 minute TV show will show so much grace towards an hour and a half film. And it's like, all right, you're automatically earning some points here. Um, I, I think it's recommendable. I think it's, it's, it, there is nothing there, but fun thrill. Uh, and I will note for the tangled heads in the audience that Mandy Moore does say, uh, best night ever uh, at the top of the film when after they have their evening out with the friends which is a i thought fun little best riff on best ever. day ever uh, <laughs> from tangled um so yeah i think it's you know it is it is popcorn entertainment yeah absolutely absolutely soggy um, popcorn so yeah don't don't take your popcorn <laughs> to the you're immediately out of your depth it's not great um so uh yeah i'm i'm, I'm right there with you uh I, I love what vera said earlier like it's it's a it's a great like b-movie shark movie so like it this is ideal fodder for shark week like if you're into shark week and you have not seen 47 47 meters down <laughs> that is like that is absolutely what you need to watch. Um, I think if somebody's looking for something that's going to automatically, uh, you know, push on the more thoughtful or reflective or introspective versions, that this is not that film. Um, but if you're looking for something that's good, fun, uh, you know, cheesy popcorn kind of B movie, and especially for the aquatic horror fans uh, in our audience, it's absolutely easy recommendable. It will ask so little of you except for, uh, you know, just a pacemaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when i texted y'all i think it was the second drop they have when you think they're when you know based on runtime they're not coming back up yet but right, when right. they drop again it's like oh, oh god please <laughs> make it stop and then it lands on her dang leg I'm like oh my god, i'm dead <laughs> i'm just dead what i wrote down as our fi my final note here is when <laughs> i said her swimming out past the drop off time to embrace oblivion <laughs> like just kill me please no, eat done. me you know <laughs> like if, yeah. if the three of us get stuck in a cage at the bottom of the ocean just just pummel me <laughs> i don't i don't i don't want to die by the shark i don't want to die at all but like oh my god just make it quick That's... i don't want to die by shark by ben's by <laughs> none of it i don't want to drown Drowning, by oblivion by getting lost. Oh my God! Yeah. No, take us out. Take us out. I'm getting the okay. heebie music. No, just, 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 real quick. <laughs> just real quick. Y'all ever seen? Y'all ever seen the the more recent movie Underwater? You ever you ever see that yeah. one with Kristen Stewart? Oh my gosh! When the mon I, I won't spoil what the monster is because that's kind of a surprise. But when the monster finally reveals itself, like you want to talk about like freaking out of something like emerging from nothingness, it's like yeah, it's yeah, 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 yeah. We should we should we should move on. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that puts our second installment of our uh, first half of our umbrella series, "What Scares Us," in the books. Want to say and always uh, welcome and a especially big thank you to Vera Gowdy, our uh, former foreign correspondent and uh, ongoing Fog Did staff member. I'm still in Canada. No, no, but just like <laughs> I don't know that we're keeping campaign language after the. Oh. You know, well, after that's the that's 
it's more journalistic than campaign style. That's a fair point. That's a fair yeah. point. You'll, you'll, you'll always be a member of the fog staff. So yes. we're, we're grateful for it. Grateful for you coming back to join this conversation and for recommending 47 meters down. Um, you too can make a recommendation for us. Go to fear of Click on the <laughs> banner. Tell us exactly what scares you in the little submission form there. Um, and so I'll have a girl next week if everything goes according to plan we are going to do something a little different we mentioned this last week on pumpkin head to give you plenty of time because it's a lengthier viewing experience but if everything goes according to plan next week we are going to be gathering uh the pod bros together for an early quarterly king and that is to discuss his made for television miniseries storm of the century so it is available to watch for free on youtube um you do not have to like rent it or anything the entire thing is there available for free and has been for months so i don't anticipate it going away anytime soon um so you can check it out there or you can buy the dvd on easily on amazon for like seven bucks but um it is uh, storm of the century is going to be our featured conversation next week um and so feel free to check that out it's a heavy film, but we recommend it, and uh, we will be having a discussion about it next week. So, as we say on every episode, um, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but not the end of the conversation. And in that spirit, we encourage you to fear nothing else, despite our series on what scares us. Fear nothing else, and be on your way rejoicing. And we'll see you next week, everybody. See you guys. See you. I have a tiny tooth that fell. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love it. Good job, That's sweetie. So Where did it fall out? Oh, thank you. It's tiny. I'm going to put it right there. Okay. Uh, it was the lock tooth. Okay. Thank you, sweetie. Go back to bed, okay? I love you. Okay, thanks, sweetie. <laughs> that oh wonderful. That was special. That was adorable. <laughs> <laughs>